let's jump in to our lesson tonight. Again, lesson four, hospitality of sacred, uh, and sacrifice of Abraham and the revelations of Jacob. And we're looking, of course, at the person of Christ in the scriptures in the Old Testament. That's what we're concerned about, and that's what we'll be talking about. So this is one, again, continuation of the of the manifestations of the fleshless, the asarkos in Greek, logos, or word of God, in the Old Testament. Uh, we saw how he was the, uh, the son as creator. We've seen that. We're going to see uh, next week, or in two weeks, we're going to see uh, the burning yet unconsumed bush appearing to Moses. Uh, and so going forward, we'll see how he leads Israel out of Egypt. We'll see how the God seer's quest for the face of God, a whole section dedicated to that, the lawgiver, the vision of the prophet Isaiah, the ancient of days, he that preserved the free use in the furnace and other manifestations of the flesher's word in the Old Testament. Tonight, talking and leading and guiding Abraham and Jacob. The biblical narrative of the hospitality of Abraham begins as follows. God appeared to Abraham. Abraham did not, of course, see, as we've shown again and again, the essence of God. But he appeared as he alone understood and as he was able to see him. That's, again, the theme, if you were with us the previous week, is the condescension of God to our level and appearing so that we can communicate. As a man, God appeared to Abraham, and in a human manner, he spoke to him. Abraham, that great patriarch, did not see God as God, in other words, his essence, as is St. Gregory the Theologian, but rather hosted him as a man, and he was praised for it, and he re for he respected that which he understood. In other words, he showed respect, even though he didn't understand totally. What he did understand, he showed respect for. That's a lesson we all need to learn as well. Right? We don't understand always, but we can always show respect uh, for what God is showing us and not stand incredulous or proud and judgmental, as so often is the case with proud modern man. Falls into delusions and the darkness of atheism and all the rest because he cannot humble himself and say, I don't know, but I respect what God is doing. And this is what you see with the patriarchs and in the Old Testament here in the next hour or so when we present, you'll see again and again. This amazing uh, relationship and humility that they show before the angel of great counsel. According to scripture, three men visited him. Three men visited him. We have an icon here on the left. If you're not familiar with it, this is the icon of St. Andre Rublev. The, uh, the hospitality of Abraham is the actual name of the icon but it's often referred to as the icon of the holy trinity it's sometimes placed in in the church as representing or showing forth the holy trinity that is a minor as you'll see tonight that is a minor view of a few fathers but the consensus is that this is not actually and cannot be as you'll see an appearance of the holy trinity but the asarkos logos and two angels the fleshless logos and two angels. According to scripture, three men visited him. The divinely initiated Abraham, hierotipos is the Greek word. I really didn't know how to translate it. It's more or less in the form, holy form or way. Hieros is holy. Typos, type. Uh, in a, and it's, it's basically prefigurement in a holy way. Uh, sees in the three men the type of the Holy Trinity, the type of the Holy Trinity. And with his foreign eyes, foreseen eyes, he recognizes the one of the Trinity, the fleshless logos, accompanied by two angels. So on the one hand, we have the type of the Holy Trinity, but we actually have an appearance of the logos, the Asarco logos, accompanied by two angels. St. John Chrysostom, one of, the, one of the main sources of a lot of our interpretation here tonight. St. John Chrysostom. And the majority of the Holy Fathers state that the three men were the Son accompanied by two angels. Abraham speaks only to the one and refers to him in the singular as Lord. And then continues in the plural saying, your feet, in one line there in Genesis. So he says in, in the, almost the same breath, 
the Lord speaking to one, and then your feet speaking to apparently all three. So that's something very indicative of what we're seeing. He only speaks to the one, for he understands that he who had come close to him had not come by accident, for indeed he even knew the name of his wife. He, he says, without having asked or heard or inquired at all, he says the name of his wife, who had chuckled in the back, if you remember the story, when he when the uh, visitors, the visitor, the angel, uh, the man, the, the one speaking, said she will give birth. And she was already quite advanced in age, and she laughed. And he said, why did, you, why did your wife laugh? And then she said, oh, I didn't laugh. And said, you did laugh. In fact, you did laugh. So he knew the name, said the name of his wife. And so that was indicative of a godly attribute, the knowledge of something without you know, having any human way to know. It was on account of his virtue of hospitality that he was made worthy of this divine theophany. That's also very instructive for us. You know that in the old country, more so than in the new world, hospitality is extremely important. And for the Greek people, at least where I lived for 20 years, it is really constantly on display for any visitors whatsoever. And it is seen as an honor to have a visitor to one's house. And they go outside of uh, the, you know, beyond the expectations to show their joy and their respect for the visitor. I think this is what you see also here. If you read the scriptural passage, you'll see that he ran and he collected everything he could to, to present. It was very much a scene that I had, when I was reading, I thought this is, I've seen this scene before in, uh, in Greece. Uh, when an unexpected visitor came to friends or relatives, everything stopped and everyone ran to present, to, to provide for them. And they would say, please take off your shoes and put on the slippers. Come over here and sit down. What can I get you to drink? What can I get you to eat? Uh, please stay for lunch. Please stay for dinner. No, please uh, take this. This is a special liqueur that we present. Here's coffee. What else can I get you? Uh, and this is not something all that exceptional in my experience in Greece. It was quite common. That's how at least the proper uh, uh, wife or mother would take care of the visitors who had come to the house. And so this, this is the kind of hospitality that, that brought about the divine theophany, according to St. John. Because Abraham spread out the net of hospitality he was made worthy to receive the lord of all together with his angels both the lord and his angels appeared in the same form in the tent of abraham the angels sent as servants for the destruction of the cities of sodom and gomorrah good to remember that today while he remained as a friend the lord remained as a friend speaking to a friend announcing to the righteous one nearly all that would come to pass another sign of course, that we're talking to the angel of great counsel, the Asarchos Logos. In the above cited passages of Chrysostom, John St. John Chrysostom, the idea that the three men are the Holy Trinity is ruled out. For he clearly distinguishes the two angels from the Lord. More particularly, the same saint explains in another place who exactly is the Lord who is appearing. The Son of God is he who appears to Abraham, together with the two angels. Abraham entreats the Lord concerning Sodom. The two angels draw near un, unto, it should be, unto Lot. So we have from St. John Chrysostom very clear that this is the Logos with two angels and not a, and not a, appearance of the Holy Trinity. The type, of course, is three, and so points to the Holy Trinity, but we don't have an appearance of. The icon here on the left, which unfortunately I could not make bigger, is a series of icons describing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the saving of Lot and, and the rest. I thought it was very interesting, a Russian icon. The compassionate and merciful God manifesting his goodness appeared then in the form of a man and remained there. 
conversing with the patriarch while his angels departed for Sodom. This is St. John Chrysostom, just kind of reiterating what the author had already said. There's an icon of St. John, one of the best, nicer icons of St. John. is a great hierarch, patriarch of Constantinople. For all of you who don't know, end of the fourth century, beginning of the fifth. In other patristic texts that are attributed to St. John Chrysostom, the presence of the sun with two angels in the tent of Abraham is highlighted. So he clearly saw, the fathers clearly saw this. It's, uh, it's quite amazing that there are certain ecclesiastical figures who did not see that this was the, pre, the, fresh, the fleshless or pre-incarnate logos continually appearing, speaking, interacting. He writes, we see him, the son, there in the tent of Abraham and with the two angels that came with him. Christ appeared to you, O marvelous one, followed by two angels. On a, and on account of hospitality, you became, O dwellers with God. O dweller uh, became, let's see, that's a typo, became dwellers with God and with angels. I think this is what it should be, not O. O blessed tent, which by divine economy contained God and angels. Christ appeared to you in the form of a man, manifesting to you the mysteries of his divine and salvific arrival. For you had another set of eyes with which the master was recognized, spiritualized. You knew that is, that is the mediator of God, the son, and received the good news about your only begotten son from the only begotten God. This is a kind of almost a hymnography that's been uh, come down to us, tribute to St. John Chrysostom. Now, St. Justin, the philosopher and martyr, likewise says that those who, by the way, for those who, who don't know St. Justin, the martyr, we're talking about a uh, very early uh, apologist for the faith in the first, second centuries, and uh, a great, uh, a great teacher at the time, and a, not a not a far uh, disciple of the disciples. Saint Justin, the philosopher and martyr, likewise says that those who appeared to Abraham are the son and logos of God, together with the two angels. Quote: One of the three, who is both God and Lord, is the Lord of the two angels. Saint Justin, martyr. He, God upon earth, in other words, the Son, appeared to Abraham in the form of a man like unto the two angels that accompanied him. So we see the Son and Logos appeared on earth. He's the God upon the earth, the Son, to Abraham in the form of a man. So he appears and he talks like a man to him. And yet Abraham recognizes him as God. This is really quite phenomenal. Long before the incarnation, long before Peter and his confession of the divine humanity, you see the prophets, the patriarchs, already seen and conversing with the locals who will be a common card. I think most of us are, I know I was, in the dark for most of my life with regard to these mysteries that have been revealed in the Old Testament. I think a lot of us are under the false impression the Old Testament is just, I don't know, a book to, for, you know, to read for Ten Commandments or history or maybe a you know, Proverbs or something like this, instead of understanding that it shows forth the, the incarnate Logos as the fleshless Logos. And again and again, it's the same one speaking to the prophets and to the patriarchs. Very important because not a few have fallen away, not a few very bright men have fallen away into delusion, not seeing Christ throughout the Old Testament. St. Theodore of Edessa likewise states that Abraham was made worthy on account of his wonderful table offering, his meal, in other words, having given hospitality to angels and indeed the master of all. Likewise, St. Maximus the Confessor states that it was God, the Son, the two angels who appeared under Abraham, unto Abraham, that should be. And St. John of Damascus also records in his hymnography in the tent, Abraham gazed upon that mystery within thee, O Theotokos. Thy son, yet fleshless, did he receive. Again and again, the, the patristic consensus here. 
we have likewise a witness of St. Paisus the Great. St. Paisus the Great, one of the desert fathers, one of the great ascetics in the deserts of Egypt, to whom Christ appeared while he was at prayer in his cell together with two angels, just as he once had appeared to the patriarch Abraham, it says in the great Synax Adistis, in the recording of the life of the saint, the, the sacred writer of the life, likens that appearance to that which Abraham had had. And that Abraham understood that he had received God is apparent from the words we read in Scripture. Midamos kirie okrinon pasandingin. That is, be far from the Lord, he who judges the earth. So the Abraham speaks to this angel, this man, the angel of good counsel, the Lord, and he calls him Lord, judge of the earth. He understood that he was speaking to the fleshless logos, and he called him judge. And then he goes on. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, 25. He calls him the judge of all the earth. There's only one who's the judge of all the earth. For the Father, it says now in John 5, 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but he committeth all judgment unto the Son. So this is a confession of faith that he's talking to the logos who will become incarnate, the pre-incarnate Logos, the Son. Not the Father. The Father is not speaking here, but the Son. This is another clear indication of Christ speaking to the patriarchs, the pre-incarnate Logos. Since those speaking with Abraham, since he spoke with Abraham and was named, uh, or rather was called, that's a typo. All this was done fairly, fairly quickly and has typos, was called uh, the judge is the son and logos. That should be son and logos. Forgive me for the typos. I'll be correcting this before you. I issue it. So he spoke with Abraham and he was named or called uh, the judge and this is the son and logos. It is not possible for the other two who were sent to destroy Sodom to be the father and the Holy Spirit. For the father is always he who sends. And never the one who is sent. So the fact that those two angels were sent to Sodom and destroyed means that it's not, we're not talking about the Father. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about, at least not the Father. We're not talking about the Father because he is the one who sends, not is sent. And then St. Gregory Valma says this very interesting thing about the sending. And this is where, unfortunately, our friends in the West who have adopted the heretical filioque, they don't understand to this day. They do not understand the difference, differentiation here. The difference between sending and procession, que pemdo, pemdo imas pemdo, pemt, to send. And so he is talking here, St. Gregory Bama says, the son is sent, in other words, the economy of salvation, not the eternal procession, not the relationship of the persons, but in time and space he is sent, we're not talking about procession here, as God from both the Father and the Spirit, the son is sent as both God as God from both Father and the Spirit. That's how it is in terms of the economy of salvation. And so this is clearly the Son that's being referred to here and the one who is sent. Beneficence is from the Father himself. Punishment, however, and the state of hell are not the work of his goodness. People say God created hell. God made evil. No, 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 it's blasphemy. 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 He is not the creator of hell. He's not the creator of evil. He's not the source of evil. He's not the source of hell. This is all the making of men and demons. So punishment is meted out either by angels or by men or in another way. In other words, the fulfillment of the laws, the spiritual laws, uh, the fruit of our sin and all that is meted out shown, delivered by men or by angels or by another way, not by God the Father. Therefore, it is not possible for the Father and the Holy Spirit to come down and be present in order to destroy Sodom. Another reason why it cannot be the Father and the Holy Spirit going 
but two angels. But those who delivered the punishment were two angels, as is witnessed to in many places by the Holy Fathers. All right. So should be beyond a shadow of a doubt here that we're talking, that Abraham is talking to the Logos, pre-incarnate. Then what we have here is the only begotten son and two angels and not the Holy Trinity is also apparent in the very narrative within Holy Scripture itself. So just reading the narrative, we should be fairly clear what we're dealing with. And the Lord went his way as soon as he led, left communing with Abraham. So that's Genesis 18.33. So it shows that the Lord goes his way. And then it says a little bit later, and there came two angels to Sodom. Two angels to Sodom. The one goes this way, the two go that way. So according to Patristic interpretation, the three men are not the Holy Trinity, again, typo, but the only begotten Son and Logos accompanied by two angels. And this is the view. This view is dominant, even though there are other opinions, even though there are other opinions, or at least there appears to be. And I'm not always sure that they're not also just saying that it is a type typology. Let's go on now to part two of our lecture tonight, which is the sacrifice of Abraham. The sacrifice of Abraham, very instructive and important as well in the prefigurement of the sacrifice on the cross of our Lord. God was very pleased with the obedience, righteousness, and great faith of the patriarch Abraham. And thus appeared to him many times and held converse with him. He led him into the land of Canaan and promised that from his generation, the Messiah would be born. His generation meaning his successors, his descendants. Afterwards, however, God put him to the test, should be him to the test, asking him to sacrifice his son, Isaac. So on the one hand, he said, from your loin, from your descendants, myriads, right? The Messiah will come, but many will be your descendants. And yet he says, sacrifice Isaac. So it's not possible that he would not be filled with thoughts. Lo is me, we say in Greek, right? Filled with thoughts. Oh, my goodness. Again, we see the unbelievable faith, trust that he had. We talked about this last night, how fundamental it is to stand with uh, with uh, total trust in the, the god man and without that there's no advancement in, in communion in the spiritual life so he implicitly and totally trusts the lord even though he's telling him exactly the opposite of what he had already promised abraham was obedient to the command of god the god who spoke with abraham was the fleshless logos appearing as the angel of the Lord, the angel of great counsel. His, he clearly distinguishes himself from God, for he should be one. He identifies himself with God, right? Saying, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. I think that's a typo. Let me see. Did I put that in there? They're wrong. Hmm. One moment. I think I might have a typo here, and I was rushing to get it all together. Let me see. And I'll go back to the original text. Um, so, for he, he distinguishes himself from God, for he identifies himself with God. So there's a typo there. I don't know why. Let me go back to the original Greek. Forgive me. One second. Um, yes, I think we have missing text. He 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 distinguishes from God and he says, Now I know that thou fearest God. Okay, so that's missing from the text. Forgive me. So he says on the one hand, now I know that thou fearest God. So he speaks of God as someone else, right? So he distinguishes himself from God. That's what the first part here. He clearly distinguishes himself from God. But then, so see, that's why the he is twice there, because some text got erased somehow. But then he says also, 
the same time, he identifies himself with God. He distinguishes himself with God, and he identifies himself with God. And he says, Thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So clearly he's saying that you're, I am the one, I'm the God that you're going to be you know, obeying and sacrificing to. So at the, one at the same time he does that. And that makes total sense, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, you have God the Father. And we, the, the, he speaks about God the Father and the offering to God the Father. And on the other hand, he is the Logos speaking directly and identifies with God. The angel of the Lord loosed Isaac and was bound and who was bound hand and foot by Abraham. And instead of him, he provided a ram which was found in the thicket of Sebek. That's I think from the Septuagint. I can find that in the King James. The Holy Spirit distributed the great mystery to both of them, to the beloved son and to the ram. This is now St. Gregory of Nisa talking. And he interprets this. He says that the Holy Spirit distributed this great mystery, this mystery of obedience, the mystery of the ultimately the incarnation is being foreshadowed here. The great mystery to both of them, to the beloved son and to the ram, which was sacrificed. Uh, such as the ram, which was sacrificed, we see the mystery of death, which would be denoted. And with the son, the only son, which was saved, the life which does not end with death would be shown forth. And so at one and the same time, we have both showing forth of the death and the resurrection, the life that has uh, victory over death. Uh, with the ram that will be sacrificed and with the son who will be saved, according to St. Gregory of Nisa. Patriarch Abraham not only saw and spoke with the fleshless logos, he was also made worthy to become his forefather according to the flesh. According, according to the flesh, for Christ was born from his descendants. Indeed, according to the witness of the Lord, he saw prophetically the day of the Lord. Abraham, he says in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Of course, that's when the Jews became irate with the Lord. For they knew what he was saying. He identified himself with the with the logos, the flesh of logos. He was saying, I am the logos, now incarnate. According to the Holy Father, the day of the Lord is the day of his coming in the flesh, or more precisely, the day of his passion, which we foretold with the exactitude with the offering of this ram and of Isaac. So it's interesting how he said, Abraham saw my day. And he saw it, he rejoiced to see my day, he saw it and was glad. So did he see it right there in the sacrifice of Isaac? In the sacrifice of Isaac, he, of his only begotten son, he was prefigured. He saw prefigured the passion of the only begotten son of God. Is that what the Lord is talking about? Maybe. It was there as a type. It was clearly there shown forth. The incarnation and indeed the very sacrifice was shown forth in the sacrifice of Patriarch of his son Isaac, which of course the Lord prevented from going forward. But it's all there. And that's very interesting. I never thought about that until I read this book. I don't know. Have you ever thought about that? Had you ever thought that maybe that's what the Lord meant by saw it and was glad? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe more directly as well. Maybe it was confirmed as well in time and space later on. The appearance to Jacob, now. Now we're going to Jacob. And his the, the appearances or revelations to Jacob in the scriptures. You can see right there the icon of the famous icon of Jacob's ladder, the vision that we're going to talk about here. In the beginning, he appeared to him as Lord in a dream on his way to Haran, standing at the top of a ladder. That reached up to heaven and revealed to him that he is the God of his fathers, of Abraham and Isaac, and made promises to him. This is a vision of the Logos. But I neglected to read the previous part, which is the beginning of this section. God appeared to the patriarch Jacob five times with different names Lord, Angel, Man, God, and God of thy fathers. Five different names for the fleshless logos. 
Lord, angel, man, God, God of thy fathers, all right? So many names in the Old Testament for the one Lord, many names. So he appeared and he showed him and he said, he's the God of, the, of his fathers and he made promises to him. And Jacob then named that place where he had the vision, house of God in Hebrew, Bethel. Jacob saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder and the Lord standing firmly at the top. Him does he now call both angel and God. God, because he is so by his nature, angel, that is messenger, so that he may know that we may know that he was he who was seen is not the father, but the only begotten son. Since whose angel or messenger would the father be? Cannot be the God of the Father. This is a rebuke, by the way, to the Jews, to the Muslims, and to all those who reject the Logos being already appearing pre incarnation and only seeing God the Father in everything. Whose messenger would he be? Remember how the Lord stumped the Jews? How the Lord said to my Lord, How can the Lord say to my Lord? That this is what we're talking about throughout the Old Testament. And they said, well, we, we don't know. What does that mean? How could that be? Because they did not see. Just like today's millions upon millions of Muslims and millions of Jews do not see. They still do not see, unfortunately. And lar largely because of our sins, largely because of our lack of love of the Lord, they do not see. So who could that messenger be if it was the Father himself? The Son, on the other hand, is both God and angel of great counsel, since it was he that proclaimed to us the mysteries of the Father. For he says, all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. All things I have heard, he says. So he is the messenger. He is the angel of great counsel. He's the only one that can be appearing and is witnessed to by Jacob as being the Logos. The same God, that is, this, the Logos, appeared to him before his return to his fatherland. As an angel of God and confirmed that he was the same God who had appeared to him earlier in Bethel. So another witness in scripture. Another witness in scripture. If you're interested and you don't know the scriptural passage, we're talking about Genesis 32. 24 to 32 is particularly with, with the wrestling, but Genesis 32 and thereabouts is where we're, we're looking at right now. So he appears... And he says, I'm the same one as I appeared before. Here's another icon of the vision uh, of uh, Jacob. Uh, beautiful icon. What a beautiful icon. And you see the incarnation at the top of the, the image of the incarnation. Mother of God, Christ, is an image of the incarnation. So now we go to this next very interesting section toward the end of our presentation. Uh, before we open it up to uh, questions. And we're talking now about the appearance of, to Jacob in the form of a wrestler. When the patriarch was nearing his fatherland, fearful and anxious over his coming meeting with his angry brother Esau, in the night a man appeared, a man appeared in the middle of the night and wrestled with him. Clearly, that would have been startling, and he would have said, what is this all about here? out of nowhere in the middle of the night. The appearing one wished to comfort and encourage Jacob, his chosen. Interesting that he wrestles with him to do so. <laughs> when Jacob sought to learn the name of the nocturnal wrestler, he was unsuccessful and reproached. So, so far, we're wondering who could this be? Doesn't, it doesn't appear to be signs that we're talking about the fleshly. Logos, but let's go on. These are beautiful icons, by the way. Thanks be to God, I'm using them. Do not know exactly who is the iconographer of all these icons, but uh, hopefully you'll be inspired and maybe even go and purchase one of them. We will support the work. This is uh, absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. Very interesting. Showing the wrestling with the angel of, uh, of Jacob. Who could the nocturnal wrestler have been? Scripture calls him a man. They wrestled a man with him. And yet, 
He's also called God. Jacob says, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So I find that it's very, very interesting. You, you're looking at, in particular, uh, you want uh, verse 30. 3230 is where we're at right now. I should have put it on the screen. If you're following the scriptures, 3230. And so he call he says, I've seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. The word is the face of God, since through him God enlightens and becomes known. So face to face, he's seen the face of God. Well, this is the word, not the Father. Then was Jacob named Israel. When he had seen God the Lord. This is God the Word. Because the patriarch Jacob had seen him, the Logos, who is the appearance or form of God, and was blessed and named by God, Israel instead of Jacob. So the Logos or form of God. And was blessed and named by God, Israel instead of Jacob. For that reason, Jacob called the name of that place appearance of God. So face, God is the logos, is the face of God. He, as they call the place the appearance of God, he says, I seek God face to face. Everything is pointing to the asarkos or fleshless logos. Look at this beautiful uh, three. Uh, it's called a triptych in Greek. Three icons in one. It has the incarnation in the middle. And it has Jacob wrestling on the left. And Jacob seeing the ladder of divine descent on the right. Uh, and has the prophet Elias and Moses on the Mount uh, of Tabor in the middle. This is an icon. I actually know that this icon is from Father Aiden. I believe it's from Father Aiden in the UK. So if you're interested in this icon and others, that you can look that up online. Beautiful, beautiful icon. In other words, the one that appeared is God, called God and man. God and man. Mm. Theanthropos, the God-man. Prefigurement of the incarnation. That is Theanthropos. And there can be no doubt that he is the fleshless son of, and word of God, the angel of great counsel, according to the interpretation of the Holy Fathers. By the time we're done with this course, you're going to be blown away how everywhere throughout Scripture the Lord is present. The incarnate logos, the pre the pre-incarnate logos, the ascended logos with our flesh, he's everywhere present. He fills all things. He's everywhere present. He's always God is Christ is all in all. And anyone who's going to finish this course can never, ever turn away from the incarnation and go back to the darkness uh, of the uh so-called religions of Abraham. What a night, what a lie. Do you know that they're establishing in the middle of Somewhere in the Middle East, I forget exactly where, Dubai, I think. They have three temples that they've established, one right next to the Jewish, Christian, and uh, so supposedly Christian, and Muslim. And the Pope himself went there, and I think twice, maybe, I think, or at least once, but maybe twice. And, and you know, is working in this pan religious, syncretistic way. Uh, supposedly, you know, they're pointing to the, to the one God. But here, it's clear as everyone is paying attention, that they're not worshiping the God of the Old Testament. They don't worship the Logos, the pre-incarnate Logos. They don't even know how to read the scriptures. If you don't know the incarnation, you can never understand the Old Testament. Closed book. To Jews and Muslims alike, it's a closed book. I think all of you understand already that it's a closed book, but wait until we go through all the rest for the next six months, and you will be blown away how much Points, everything points to Christ, the Theanthropos, all right? So all this, according to, uh, actually, I, at this point, I don't have on the screen the patristic references. Sorry about that. In the PDF, we'll make sure that it is there so all of you will get the PDF. All this teaches us that the only begotten Son and Word of God and God appeared to Jacob here once more. St. Justin gives the same interpretation, Justin Martyr. He was both angel and God and Lord and wrestled in the form of a man with Jacob. So from the beginning, in the first centuries, first 150 years, the great defenders and the 
the, the great uh, expositors and witnesses of the incarnation saw all of this. This is not something that we figured out some point in the third, fifth, tenth century. In the beginning, the experience of the church was that this is the, and they saw all of this in the Old Testament. They saw all the fulfillment in the, the prophets. Christ opened the mind to the apostles, and all the disciples of the disciples knew through the holy tradition that had been passed down to them how it is truly what poverty Protestantism has. What poverty? They've, they've, they've cut off, what's the expression? They've cut off their nose despite their faith. They cut off, they've cut off themselves from the living water, the living tradition. And you can see it. I was just corresponding with somebody who was taking issue. We had a video go live here a few days ago uh, on the uh, Z Media uh, platform. We did an interview. If you haven't seen it, check it out on uh, Rumble, the Z Media. We did a very, I think, very interesting interview. And the people underneath a lot of our products, and they're saying, well, this father, why are you call no man father, right? So we're sitting here answering the same old, same old from the Protestants, the poor Protestants. The why that they don't understand the scripture, they don't understand why that's not a, that's not what they think it is, a total 100% uh, abrogation of the term father for everyone. It's not the case. Never has been, never will be. Anyway, we explain all that in a, actually a new video just put on uh, a couple hours ago on the Orthodox Ethos uh, website, if you're interested in the YouTube channel for that topic. But underneath, he's going on uh, and and he's like, you don't need the Holy Fathers. You don't need to read the early church writers. They're interesting, but it's not important. What's important is scripture. And if you just go to scripture, you'll understand everything. And it's just unbelievably absurd, as if these things are opposed, as if they're not born in the, in the same womb of the church, as if the one part and parcel of the Lord is speaking to them and speaking through the scriptures all one. Why are you why are you opposing? Why are you standing opposed to the, to the disciples and, and their disciples and disciples of their disciples? Why why would you do that? If you're not in darkness about the presence of God, Christ throughout history, and so Saint Saint Justin here, same interpretation, Saint John Chrysostom, the Old Testament prophets, are it's all together, one witness. He was both angel and God and Lord, and wrestled in the form of a man with Jacob. He says likewise. Procopius of Gaza, a little bit later, also writes, God wrestled with Jacob as a man. Let the Jews not disbelieve. When they see the same God and man coming in the last years to save humanity, clearly saying to the Jews, you don't know your scriptures. Can you imagine these coming now today and say we have the same God as the Jews and the Muslims? When they reject the logos? It's absurd. And yet this is where we're at. Uh, utter poverty. And anyone among the Orthodox who departs from the fathers and embraces the ban Triskia, the, the, the interreligious, syncretistic, you know, perennialist, universalist the vision of things. I don't know. God help them. I mean, they're leaving the treasure. They're throwing away all the, the, the riches of the spiritual wisdom of the fathers for, for, for nothing. For nothing. God help them. Why does the fleshless word present himself as a man? And what is the meaning of this struggle with Jacob? What is the meaning of the struggle with Jacob? Here we have another icon, beautiful icon, of, I think, from Father Aiden again, showing the struggle. Well, actually, it's, it's in the triptych we saw earlier. Although this condescension is great, it should not surprise us. The appearance of the Logos as a man was a foretelling of his incarnation. In that nocturnal wrestling, Jacob was enigmatically foreseeing the incarnate God. As the hymnographer writes, this wrestling engagement, the symbloki in Greek, uh, rendered here as wrestling engagement, okay? It's a confrontation, but it's a, it's a, it's like you see in the, like you see in the icon here, it's, they're like this, right? It's not like from a distance with swords. They're wrestling, they're like one intertwined with the other, right? That's what this, this symbloki means in Greek. This wrestling engagement of the man with God was a pre-revelation of the mystery of the incarnation, of the union of God with man, pointing again to the salvation of mankind in Christ. Here's another icon, a very beautiful icon. I wonder, I don't know who did this. Uh, did not have the, the time to, to, to pay attention when I was preparing today. Thank you, I hope. Uh, you can search online as well, and you can find it. If you like it, go buy it. Support the people. 
So it was a symbol, a symbolic act of the hypostatic union of the divine and human natures. God the Word, who wrestled with Jacob, symbolically foretold the secret engagement that is his voluntary union with men. Again, you cannot see this. Right? You, If you are a typical fleshly, un regenerated, uninitiated man, you pick up the Bible and you read, you may or may not see this, unless you have some help from fathers and others who are enlightened. But just on your own, you're reading it, you see two people wrestle in the middle of the night, you're probably not gonna see this. So this is a revelation uh, in and through the church fathers and the interpreters of the Holy Writ, uh, that this is a uh, symbol of the hypostatic union of the divine human natures. Later also, when at the command of God, Jacob went to the location Luz, that is Bethel, where God had first appeared to him to build an altar, God again appeared to him, repeating his re renaming from Jacob to Israel and renewing his promises of the great multitude and glory of his descent. So why is the Lord doing all this if there's not going to be a fulfillment in, in, the, in the incarnation and therefore a opening up to every tribe and every people on the face of the earth to accept him as the one Lord and God and creator of all things? The Jews knew he was the one Lord and God and creator of all things. He knew that he created every, they knew he created every human being. They knew that he was a, they were a chosen people for a purpose. And yet, when the time came and the Lord opened up or began the process of opening up, which happened essentially on Pentecost, but it began with his apostles and the teaching, they could not accept. They did not see. It's very, very strange in a way. Why could they not see the fulfillment? Why had they been blinded? That's a whole other lecture. There's, there's answers to that. I'm not saying it as, as, as if I don't know, know the answer. There are plenty of answers in the fathers of why that blindness came upon them. And they're very instructive to us because many people are blinded today and going back to the vomit, as it were, of syncretistic ecumenism or perennialism or all of these uh, manifestations of the spirit of idolatry in the last days. We see this happening all over. So here he promises him that they will have many descendants, a multitude, clearly way beyond the small people of Israel that he was uh, the father of, right? So uh, prophetically showing forth. And finally, finally in tonight's talk and also this section before uh, next week, we'll go to the burning yet unconsumed bush. Very interesting. Actually, in two weeks, rather, it's to say in two weeks, we'll be doing that. Finally, when Israel was going to Egypt, he met to meet his son, Joseph, at the well of the oath. This is a picture of the well of the oath today. You see on screen. The well of the oath, Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to God. And God appeared to him in a vision of the night. Urging him not to fear to go down into Egypt, for he would be with him, foretelling also the future of his descendants. So he appeared several and many times as a man, as God, as the angel, as the Lord, and as God of thy fathers. These are the various names that appeared to Jacob. And with that, we'll close out tonight's presentation. Hopefully it's been very edifying. This is the end. Lesson four, the hospitality of sacrifice of Abraham refers to Jacob. Appreciate your patience. I'm sorry we didn't didn't really reach, uh, I would have liked to have presented more tonight. It's hard to gauge. It's hard to gauge how long it's gonna take us. Um, so maybe we'll try to fit more in next time. But I'd like to, I'd like definitely to make more progress uh, every time. But that is uh, what we have tonight. Let's see if we have some questions and comments from you all. Uh, we do have some questions. First of all, thank you very much to our brother in Christ, Caesar. Also a very generous man. 
gifted already, what, twice or three times? I think you've done this. Thank God. And thank you for helping others become members of the platform and, uh, and sharing the love. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Welcome to Patrick Peterson. Good to have you. God bless you. And Joe, who's now become a member. Thank you very much. Alex Blaird. Alex, thank you for your question. What does procession mean? Ek por, ek or ek por uh, This term is used in the patristic literature to refer only to the relationship within the Holy Trinity of God the Father and the, um, the Holy Spirit and how it emanates. So proceeds from the Father. It's in Scripture as well, of course, right? In Scripture, it, we have the same phrase. So if we go to John uh, procession, let's see, proceeds uh, from the Father. I'll bring it up here. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, send to the fa from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father. So right here in this very scriptural phrase, we have the two kinds. It's still amazing to me that the Latins have not understood that there's two things to discuss here. They're not the same. One is in time, when the helper, the comforter comes. Obviously, we're talking about in time on Pentecost. Whom I send to you from the Father. So he's sending the Holy Spirit in time. Pemboimas in Greek, right? Another word. It's not the same. And then he says, "Who? who's being sent? The spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, and he will bear witness to me. So, this is understood as being two separate different things. Who is spirit of truth? He's describing the person of the spirit of the Holy Spirit and how, how he's understood. And this is, of course, incorporated into the Creed, right? The Nicene Creed, which we read. And there's no filioque there, right? There's no and the Son. So, Proceeds from the Father. It's an eternal procession, something that is is hard to determine. Obviously, St. Gregory the Theologian famously says, you know, we don't know exactly what that means. We use these terms. We circumscribe, as it were, we are the truth of things. We say outside of this and distorting this, you fall away. That's the experience of the revelation, whether in Scripture or in the, in the life of the church. That's what how we refer to it. That's how we understand it. And there's a whole uh very rich tradition uh, literature among the fathers how we understand the relationship of the persons eternally and then there's the question of the economy of salvation coming into the world and, and mainly that means the incarnation of christ and then therefore the, the the pentecost and that is not a procession there's not the term is not used to describe the in time sending the, the term send so there's two different words I think there was a linguistic problem as well in the West. Um, maybe they, I think, I don't know, I'm not an expert on this, but I think they used either the same term to describe both, perhaps, or they didn't understand why these things would be distinctly represented. And I think to this day, this is one of the stumbling blocks. I mean, you heard this, if you listen to my presentation, a thousand years later, a thousand years after the schism, I presented about Catholicism, and I present a, uh, clip from Scott Hahn and he clearly misunderstands this. So apparently to this day in Latin slash Western theology, they don't make they can't make this distinction. So it's very important that we make the distinction. And procession is used in that way to proceed from, come forth from. When the days arrive where we can't buy food, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, because we resist the 666. Will we be condemned for allowing our children to suffer and die of salvation? Why do you think we're going to suffer and die from salvation? That's the strange question. Why, that, why does that come to your mind? Why do you think that's going to happen? That's not what our saints tell us. Our saints say that we're going to be provided for. What, what happened in the desert for, for 40 years of the people of God? They had man, manna come down from heaven. You think that the incarnate logos is going to provide more before the incarnation and the pre- there's a fleshless logos is going to provide more to the people of God than he will to the people of God after his incarnation. 
in the time of the Antichrist. He's going to provide less, not going to provide the basics. So there's no basis to say that we will have to allow anyone to suffer and die. And certainly it would be an honor if the option is deny Christ and become a servant of Antichrist or suffer and die, whatever that might mean, whether it be starvation or exile or thrown down a mine shaft or whatever it is, that's an honor for a Christian. It's a, the greatest glory is to die for Christ. If that's forced upon us, we receive it. God help us to remain firm in those days. But so that's a whole false, I don't think, I think your question is uh, interesting, but it's a false problem. It's not really, it's not a real problem. So Alex asks, but it's God's choice for those who come to know him. It's got nothing to do with being Muslim. It's about sincerity for seeking God. It's God's choice. No, it's not God's choice who comes to know him. It's not only God's choice. God wants all to come to the knowledge of God. I'm not sure what this is referring to. You're asking this, referring to something. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is referring to. Is there a, a reference here that I'm not picking up that we've, not sure. This looks like it's been asked a while ago, so I really don't know what you're referring to here, uh, Alex, but uh, uh, God desires all to come to the knowledge of truth and be saved. Uh, of course, he's knocking. We have to open the door. But then when we say yes, he does all the work, right? He's the one before the zeros. We, we, we produce all kinds of zeros, but without the one before the zeros, there's no value. And yet we have to produce the zero, right? We, we struggle, in other words. That's the ascetic life. That's the, that the, uh, the love that we return. And, how, and that's manifest in fasting and prayer and almsgiving and all the rest. That's, that's our love in return to his love, right? So, but but it, he, he never forces us. He cannot force us. So it's not like he chooses us and we just are passive receptors. Now that's that's a heresy. That sounds like Calvinism or something. I don't know. It's a synergy. It has to be a synergy. God would never, and it's clear in scripture, he never forces. He says, whoever wants to come after me, pick up his cross after me. Will you also leave too? He says to the apostles, famously, when they are scandalized, because he says, eat my body and drink my blood. So, yeah, I don't know what else I can say because I'm not really sure what you're referring to there. Uh, it's always good to restate things because this is long after you probably wrote that. What do I say to Protestants and Muslims which claim that ecumenical councils did not create the Bible? Um, so the Bible, the Bible, first of all, includes the Old Testament. So we're talking about the New Testament, I think is what you mean. Uh, the ecumenical councils did not create the Bible. That would be, that would not be accurate. Um, but the ecumenical councils or the councils of the church, the fathers of the church, uh, definitely ratified or certified which uh, uh, which books are going to be considered legitimate, canonical, and authentic. The church decided that. The church decided uh, that these letters are authentic and these are not, and they're not going to be incorporated into the, into the canon. And so Christians from that point on said, this is the scripture. And the other texts were considered Unre unreliable for the most part, right? I have this wonderful fly that just came in. Um, so, so I don't know what what uh, what to say except that that's the history. I mean, read history. All they can do is read history, and they can see clearly uh, the truth of things. That the scriptures came out from the church. The church decided which were the authentic scriptures. Of course, the saints, the apostles, produced the actual texts themselves, inspired by God. Uh, it's 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 ridiculous to think that the scriptures can be separated from the church. It's all revisionist, very late, and and um, not 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 uh, viable to to maintain that if you're going to have any kind of you know integrity historically. No membership, sorry, but what order was what order was Abraham initiated into that allowed him to see? It? allowed him to see uh, Father Israel, what did he follow a society? Okay, I don't understand your question, sir. 
What order was Abraham initiated into? What order? What are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. That allowed him to see. He, Father Israel, what did he follow? A society? No. He had the living God. That's the scriptures. Please read the scriptures. I don't know what you're talking about. Why did George, why did God damage Job's hip? Job's hip? You want to say Jacob's? You want to say Jacob's? Is that what you want to say? I think you want to say Jacob's hip. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't didn't examine that part of the scriptural guys. We can look at the scriptures if you like. We can examine them. Uh, so it says there in 24, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said to him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name should be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. So that's a very good question, very good question, which I don't have the answer to. And I don't answer questions on liturgical, I mean, uh, biblical and scriptural interpretation off the cuff. Like, oh, I think this. So I'm not going to answer you, but I will try to find the answer. Uh, and if you come back next week or in two weeks, we can if you answer it again. I'll try to have the answer for you. But I go to the fathers and the scriptural interpretation on that because there's no point otherwise. Is there a reason when Christ is represented why ICXC is not included in, in his halo? Is it because it is represented in the Old Testament? Um, we have icons here that I presented tonight. Is that what you're saying? Because we have him represented in some of the icons, you know, above the above, we have an icon. I'm looking at one right now. We can put it on the screen if you want to see. Um, I'm not sure we, that that's uh, an issue, like it's a problem or something. Let's see, where is it? Here it is. If we go back, let me put it on the screen here. Um, so this is the Angel of Great Council. And the angel struggling with with uh, them. So you're saying why don't they have ICXC in his? Uh, that's a good question. I don't. I think it would be a good question for an iconographer why they do not include uh, in those particular scenes of the great angel of great council. Um, I don't think we have any other icons here. Well, th this would be an, maybe a possibility, but that's it. Yeah. Um, even in this icon, there's no ICXC. So there you go. <laughs> I don't think it's always it's it's always uh, essential. Like if you don't have it there, then we're going to somehow abandon the uh, interpretation. But it's describing it in another form, right? So we're in the, we're in the Asak post logos, and we're in an angel describing an angel. So they put the angel in the icon. But I don't know. It's a good question. I've never thought about that as a problem. But I've also never asked an iconographer or somebody who would know what the tradition is. I don't think it's an issue though. What about uh, what about when Christ warns that if they do did as much to him, what should we expect? Indeed. Indeed. I'm not sure what you're referring to exactly. Again, because you didn't refer to it in the middle of this of the I mean you're referring to something I said, obviously. So I don't know what it is though here. I don't see it during the live stream. But we will, we should expect whatever Christ suffered. And so this whole idea of like, we're going to be spared suffering, we're going to be spared uh, uh, the cross, we're going to be spared uh, martyrdom or exile or anything like that is, is delusional. He didn't say that to us. He said, if they did it to me, they'll do it to you and, and uh, you'll be brought before the judges of the world, you'll be uh, condemned. You'll, it, it, he clearly tells us that we're not going to be spared. So I don't know why there are Protestants, people who believe in the rapture and other things, who have this idea that some, for some reason, that's consistent with Scripture. It's not. Father Peter, would it be possible for a new monastic communities to perform on the Holy Mountain? Um, 
not not ruling monasteries because those are established 20 ruling monasteries but new monastic communities are formed again and again and are formed all the time in smaller cells or smaller skeets uh, a whole bunch of them were formed in the last 50 years uh, elder elder prem uh, was in a small skeet he had many many disciples and they asked him to take over monasteries and then he's from his disciples they started three other they re-established or, or rejuvenated uh three other monasteries on Mount Athos. And there were several monasteries where fathers came from outside of Mount Athos and, and, and lived the monastic life in, in, in one of the ruling monasteries. So certainly, certainly there could be new monastic communities uh, on Mount Athos. Are LGBT not allowed to be members of the church? If, uh, Oscar, thank you for the question. If, if, if by that we mean, let's define the term, somebody who says, I am... A homosexual and I am created made by God to be homosexual and I do not believe that I need to repent of being a homosexual and I can actively live out that life yes that's a that's a uh, barring like many others insistence on sin if I I came and said I am um, a somebody who continually does this sin and I don't think I need to repent of that sin that would bar me from being a disciple of Christ, obviously, right? If I if I don't want to accept the words of Christ, the words of the apostles, the words of the teachings of the fathers for 2,000 years, the clear condemnation of this lifestyle in Scripture as inconsistent with the inheritance of the kingdom of God, which is what Scripture says very clearly. And the, the Lord here is the Lord, we just said, the Lord of glory, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Asarikos Logos, the fleshless Logos is the one Speaking to Abraham, sending the angels to destroy Sodom because they were not repentant of the sin. So this idea, which is extremely diluted on the part of many heterodox and some orthodox apparently, that Christ didn't talk about homosexuality is absurd. Uh, he also refers to Sodom and Gomorrah in, in the, by name in the scriptures. So he recognizes it as the work of the scriptures being you know, true. And uh, this happened and God condemned this because they were unrepentant of the sin. So scripture is very clear that this is inconsistent with reunion, communion, restoration, and with God. And in the church, would, a, would, we, be, would we be honorable? Would we be loving? Would we be followers of Christ if we said it doesn't matter what Christ said about these things? But more to the point, it's not healing. Like you're not going to be restored to God if you insist and you do not fight against the urges and the, perversions and distortions uh, in this way. Uh, not only uh, is the church very clear on the inadmissibility of uh, the homosexual lifestyle, homosexual practices, uh, sodomy, but even the other unnatural acts within marriage uh, that are akin to that uh, are forbidden and shown to be inconsistent with a life in Christ and a rejuvenated life in Christ. So if one is unrepentant of sins, they can't be in communion with God. Like, what's the, what does that mean? Like, why would that happen? Why would you? I, I'm coming to the church. I want the church to teach me and show me Christ, in other words, to teach me and show me how to be a human being, to be, restore me to communion with God. But I don't agree with you. And I'm not going to follow you. Like, does that make any sense? Like, where does that happen? And people say, no problem. Come on in. Obviously, people who are, are insisting on this lifestyle don't believe in Christ. They don't believe Christ. So why would they be a member of Christ? It's, I, don't, I don't understand why this is even a question or an issue. We are all repenting in the church. Everyone is repenting. Every single one of us is on the path of repentance for sins, a variety of them, right? So if, if, you're, if you or anybody else wants to repent, welcome to the church. You, if you or anybody else, including bishops, priests, deacons, don't want to repent, and you're insistent on certain sins, you're you're already on the way out. You've you've stepped out of the church. The first words out of the words uh, words out of the mouth of the Lord: repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. This is what it means to be a Christian. We're constantly returning to God. That's what repentance means. We're returning to God with repentance. I want to be a Christian, but I'm not interested in returning to God. Does that make any sense? No. That's what it means to repent. Turn to God. No, no, I want to remain in my sin. I want to be independent of the teachings. I don't want to fulfill them. I don't want to be obedient. And I want to become a Christian and be known as a Christian and have the name of a Christian. Well, that's totally illogical, let alone delusional. Not possible.
Do Catholics and Protestants need to be rebaptized before they join the church? Whether they're all steal. Thank you very much for your question. God bless you. Uh, the book that we produced, I highly recommend you read it because it's a total and uh, complete treatment. Let me put it on the screen here. Uh, let's see if we can get it on the screen. And I'll take this off. One second. That's the book you're going to want to read. Uh, Weatherall. Am I saying your name right? Weatherall. Uh, that's a total and 450 page treatment of this question and why the church has taught what it's taught for, for the last thousand years consistently with regard not just to contemporary heterodox, but to all those who've come before us for 2,000 years. The nature of the church, the identity of the church, and what happens when you leave the church. And is there, a, your question basically is, is there a mystery of baptism outside of the mystery of the church, mystery of Christ? And the question is, the answer is no, that's not possible. The mysteries are one. The mysteries are united to the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the incarnation. These things are inseparable. Christ is given and gives himself in every mystery. Right? So the minute I say that there's a baptism outside of church, I'm saying there's a baptism outside of Christ. Does that make any sense? No. The minute I say that you can, Christ is initiating you into the body when you still are not a part of the body, that doesn't make any sense either. Like there's no sense in any of this if we just sit down and understand what the fathers and the apostles have taught us for 2,000 years. They're very particular. They, they There's a scandal of the particular here that you have, that Christ is in a particular time and space, and we 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 are united to Him, and that is that cannot be done piecemeal. Like you cannot be baptized but not chrismated, and not communed. This is what Roman Catholicism teaches in Vatican II. But there are people who are Vatican II teaches that Protestants are baptized, but they cannot commune of the mysteries. That's impossible from an Orthodox perspective and experience. These things are one. If you're baptized, you're you're baptized into the body of Christ, and you are going to commune. I mean, that's the whole point. Like you baptized, you're chrismated, and you commune on the same day. Children, adults, everyone in the Orthodox Church, they're baptized, they're chrismated, what you call confirmation in the West, and they're communing in the same day. These things are inseparable. So the minute you say, "I want to take this baptism outside of the context of the Church, and I want it to be independent of the Church," it makes no sense, right? So. The, the, the fundamental dogmatic answer is no, you cannot be received into the church except by baptism. Now, there's such a thing as economia in the church. And the quickest way I can explain to that, to you, that to you is the example of the thief, thief on the cross. He clearly was not baptized in water. And the Lord said, clearly you must be baptized in water. So what happened there? Well, he was crucified and he was dying. And the Lord accepted him into heaven. So this is the economy, what we call the economia of, of the Lord, right? There's things that happen outside of the strict confines of the commandments that have been given down. And that's the Lord doing them. And only he can do them. Because only, only he can abrogate, so to speak, or take put aside for a time that which he taught us is essential for salvation in, and to achieve it in another way, right? So economia is basically like a detour which returns to the, the main path, right? It's a short detour that returns to the main path. There are particular things that have to happen and particular presuppositions for this to, to be blessed. Today, many people call upon economia and they're just trampling upon the clear dogmatic teachings and the practice of the church for 2,000 years. And they're receiving people by chrismation alone uh, who need to be baptized according to the church fathers and according to the theology of the church. Uh, beyond all that, and we can go on, I, I've written a thesis, my thesis was basically on this, right? My PhD thesis, I've written, uh, I have a whole book coming out on this, so I could go on. I could give a whole lecture or two or three or five on this because it's, it's, a, it's, it's massive. But just to say some more practical stuff and then we'll move on because we actually have just three minutes and then we got to stop. Unfortunately, among 99.9% or 99.5% of all the heterodox Roman Catholics and Protestants, they do not baptize. They do not immerse, in other words. That's what the word means. The word means to immerse. That's what it means to be baptized. According to the canonical and patristic tradition of the Orthodox Church, that's what it means to be baptized. 
is you are immersed in the water three times. There's no sprinkling, there's no washing, there's no little water over the face or the head or the forehead. None of that is a part of the canonical patristic tradition. I know it happens. I know people do it all the time. I'm telling you what the fathers teach, what the canons say, the saints say. And even those saints, people think, well, those saints, yeah, there's saints today who are saying that you must be baptized three times in the water. So the, even on the very basic externals, that's been abandoned in heterodoxy. There's no basis for economia. There's no basis for departure from the need for baptism. So the answer is they need to be baptized. That's the tradition and the, and the teaching of the church when we actually sit down and examine it. But a lot of people do not. So they have all kinds of ideas. All right, next. Uh, I need to go very quickly. We have just three minutes. I, everybody who's asked the question is not going to be answered tonight because I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven questions from Hosea, Jacob, David again, Todd, Isaac, and Jacob again, and Maria. Uh, join us in the, if you want to, join us in the uh, question answer session. That's what it's for. Uh, and we'll try to answer your questions. We'll, I, I will answer your questions. Whether you join us or not, we'll transfer those over, Justin, and we'll answer those in, the, in, in, in 10 minutes. We're going to move over there in about one minute. Last question here. I'm thinking about becoming an Orthodox Christian. Can you tell me some things I need to know? There's tons of stuff you need to know. Watch our our many uh, lectures right here. Go to our lectures uh, for Orthodoxy 101. Go to orthodoxethos.com. Go to Orthodoxy 101. That'll be some of the first things. Uh, but you need to read a, a basic catechism. I would highly recommend you read The Way of a Pilgrim. Go get The Way of a Pilgrim. It's a classic. And you're going to enter immediately into some of the most beautiful spiritual literature the Orthodox Church has produced in the last couple hundred years. Way of the Ascetics, another great text. On the Jesus Prayer, these are some of the spiritual texts, right? But then you have the history, the theology. You need to go to a local Orthodox church. You need to become a catechumen. You need to start the catechumenate program if you want to become an Orthodox Christian. It might take a year or two. Don't rush. It's a process of purification. Take your time and go deep and join us again here, and we'll do whatever we can to help you. All right, that's it for tonight. We're, we're at our uh, limit. Again, uh, those seven questions that I'm looking at right here, let me just put them on the screen, that one. From Maria. Thank you, Maria. We'll answer that in about 10 minutes. This one from Jacob. Uh, we've got this one from Isaac. We've got this one from Todd. Uh, we've got this one from David. And then again, Jacob. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And this one from Hosea. All right, guys. Thank you for joining us. I'm sorry we didn't get to the questions over in Crowdcast, but I think most of you will be joining us in 10 minutes anyway, right? We'll bring those questions over as well. We, uh, uh, God willing, to get those questions. All right. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again on Tuesday for the Revelation course. And then we're going to be taking, we'll have a question answer session next Thursday, but then we'll be taking a break um, next week from this lecture this lecture will not be going on next week god bless you good good night for all of us you all of you who won't be joining us and all of you who will see you in a few minutes <laughs> Ex-Sumimatari